Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365 I'm Newsom and I'm here to break down UFC Vegas 79, which goes down this weekend. And it's got one of my favourite main events, I think, that I can remember for the entire year, especially from a fight night perspective. We've got Rafael Fazeev versus Matus Gamrot, which, like I said, it's such a good fight. I'm really looking forward to breaking that down. This weekend's event also brings the end to what I think potentially might be the longest haul of consecutive UFC events that we've had for quite a while. We do get one week break next week. And then just a quick note as well from myself, the next card in two weeks time, UFC Vegas 80, there will not be a podcast or breakdowns or predictions for that event as I'll be flying back from Turkey from my holiday and yeah, I'll miss the Monday deadline for that. So there won't be a podcast for UFC Vegas 80. However, I might put something out on Twitter or X as they call it now in regards to picks and predictions. So if you do want to know who I'm picking and predicting, then yeah, follow me on X slash Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at Newsom underscore MMA. But yeah, that's pretty much it. One week break next week and then no podcast the week after. And then we'll be back to full flow after that. And just very quickly before we get into the breakdowns and predictions, there will be a Bayes AI recap on our YouTube channel in the Bayes AI specific playlist from Noche UFC, which went down last weekend. Straight pick prediction accuracy, 67%. Six correct out of 19, sorry, nine resulted fights. You know, obviously we had the no contest and then the draw. So yeah, 67%. We'll be touching upon three or four fights individually from Bayes AI, where there was value, which you should have played, are the fights that you should have stayed away from. It's all stuff that we cover on the Bayes AI recap. So if you are interested in AI and in AI for MMA and the UFC, then make sure you check that out. And that'll be on youtube.com forward slash MMA play 365. But right now, let's get into the breakdowns. And of course, we start with the main event, the phenomenal main event between Rafael Fazeev versus Matus Gamrot. And like I said, I've said it a couple of times already, this is one of my favourite fights all year. I love the fact that it's five rounds as well. We might potentially see championship rounds. And again, I feel like that does this fight absolute justice. I think three rounds would have been a robbery for the fans, for the fighters as well, because both of these guys are going to come at each other and are going to want to, you know, if it goes five rounds, they're going to want to take each other into deep water. So yeah, really, really happy about this being a main event. And it's a phenomenal fight. As I've already mentioned, stylistically, both fighters are very well-rounded, but predominantly Fiziev's the striker. Predominantly Gamrot's the wrestler and grappler, but Fiziev can wrestle and grapple as well. Gamrot can strike as well. So it's really, really solid from a stylistic perspective. But make no mistake about it, Fiziev's going to want to keep this fight standing. Gamrot's going to want to try and ragdoll him, take him down, control positions. And again, it's just going to be back and forth, I feel, for as long as this fight goes. We've got a stylistic clash and the big question, the million dollar question is which fighter is going to be able to implement their game plan for more periods, for longer periods in this fight, more rounds than their opponent. And it's a really tough question because look, if this is a 15 minute kickboxing fight, that sorry, a 25 minute kickboxing fight, then Rafael Fazeev beats Gamrot, definitely. But if this is a 25 minute wrestle to grapple, submission grappling, submission wrestling fight, whatever you want to call it, then Gamrot beats Fiziev. So it really does depend on which fighter can make their game plan happen. Now, I kind of feel that Gamrot's going to be in trouble on the feet for as long as it is on the feet. And again, I know I've alluded to that already, but Gamrot will come in a little bit reckless. He will push the pace. He's one of these pressure heavy wrestling type of styles i explained the exact same thing regarding benoit saint denis against tiago moises just a couple of weeks ago when i broke benoit saint denis down he's the exact same style pressure heavy in your face will look to wrestle you relentlessly wrestle take you down he'll get some good positions he will let his opponent up maybe not let his opponent up as in allow him to but his opponent will be able to get back up to his feet they will then reshoot for a takedown. This is this relentless wrestling style. And it doesn't matter how many times the opponent gets back up because the takedown will just keep coming and coming and coming. And eventually, 
it will break their opponent down. Now, Rafael Fazeev, like I said, he can wrestle, but it's more from a defensive wrestling perspective. He does have decent takedown defense. He can get back up to his feet, but the thing is he can also be taken down. Now, he does have a good takedown defense percentage. I think it's at around 90%, which is ridiculously high. The one thing you have to take into consideration here, though, is Gamrot, in my opinion, is the best wrestler grappler that Fiziev will have fought in the UFC in regards to that heavy pressure that relentless style so I kind of think the statistics in regards to the numbers of Fiziev's takedown defense it goes a little bit out the window here I do think that Gamrot is going to get takedowns in this fight I do think he's going to be able to get Fiziev down I think Fiziev will defend a couple of the early takedowns maybe three or four of them I think when Gamrot does take him down the first couple of times it's going to be against the cage and then Fiziev's going to stand back up a few times as well but the thing is with Gamrot he never gets frustrated he never gets discouraged if he can't get a takedown once or twice he'll just keep rinsing and repeating and like I say, Fazeev has got to be able to manage that distance early. He's got to be able to land on Gamrot, get some respect, because if he doesn't do that early, I think Gamrot's just going to keep coming forwards and keep coming forwards. In regards to cardio, I think both fighters slow down, actually. Fazeev definitely does slow down, even though he doesn't put a high pace early in his fights, he can slow down. Gamrot, because of his style, generally slows down as well now when I say slow down I don't want people to misconstrue this in regards to I'm saying that either both fighters have got bad gas tanks because that's absolutely not the case I'm just saying both fighters do slow down naturally so when the fighters are slowing down when Fazeev and Gamrot are slowing down later in the fight I do again think that Gamrot's going to be the fighter to maybe push through that barrier a little bit more and again, just keep shooting the takedowns. And I just think it's going to be a really difficult fight for Fazeev stylistically because, yes, Fazeev has got an absolute striking advantage here. But when does Gamrot ever allow a fight to be a striking contest? Even against Jalen Turner, like Jalen Turner did a really good job of, you know, landing on Gamrot. But Gamrot, again, he wasn't getting discouraged the fact that he couldn't close the distance easily. Bear in mind, Gamrot had a lot of height and range disadvantage in that fight he had to do extra work to get inside on Turner work that he's not necessarily going to have to do in that same way against Fiziev but again Gamrot just kept on the game plan kept on the front foot kept on on the acceleration pedal coming forwards and looking to get the takedowns and eventually that's what got him the win the fact that he was relentless in what he was doing I feel like Fiziev is going to have opportunities when each when they're both standing, when each fight when each round starts, Fazeev's going to have opportunities striking. He's also going to have opportunities when Gamrot's coming in, and this is another thing for Gamrot. He's got to mind his p's and q's in regards to the entries into the takedowns because if one knee, one kick, one uppercut comes in at Gamrot whilst he's in the middle of shooting, if he telegraphs his shot, then again that could potentially put him out and render him unconscious so Fazeev's gonna have moments in this fight for sure it's too high of a level of a fight for both fighters to not have the moments even if Gamrot loses this fight Gamrot will still have his moments as well so it's just a matter of which fighter does prevail which fighter pushes that little bit harder which fighter is more relentless in trying to get the win fighting to get the win and I just think that that's going to be Gamrot I'm not sleeping on Fazeev here. I think, like I said, Fazeev's that good of a striker that it's going to be very... It's very difficult to pick against Fazeev in any fight for that reason because he's such an elite striker. But when you're looking at the styles, I do think there's going to be a lot of wrestling and grappling in this fight because Gamrot forces that style. And because of that, that's where Gamrot's best. And for those reasons, I am siding with Matus Gamrot to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is a really good co-main event as well. We've got Bryce Mitchell versus Dan Ige. And both fighters predominantly grapplers, or at least prefer to grapple. Dan Ige, he does love that knockout, you can see. But, I mean, his initial, his base within MMA is within the grappling. Of course, over the years, he's tidied up his striking. He's got knockout power. We saw against... Damon Jackson that Dan Ige can really piece another grappler up that's only wanting to try and wrestle and grapple him and that's going to be something that Bryce Mitchell has to take into consideration of course Bryce Mitchell did get hit hard against Ilya Taporia but the thing is it's like how much stock can you put into that fight we know how much of a beast Taporia is he absolutely packs power volume combinations forward pressure and I kind of feel that 
Bryce Mitchell has got a very similar style in Dan Ige to Taporia. It's just Dan Ige is a much lesser version of Taporia, if that makes sense. So Taporia has that grappling background, got good with his wrestling, tidied his striking up, got power. These are all the same things and pretty much the same process that Dan Ige went through. It's just Taporia, like I said, he's just a better version. And that's no disrespect to Dan Ige. Taporia's an absolute monster. He's one of the best in the world. I think he's a future UFC champion as well. So when you go back and look at that Bryce Mitchell fight with Taporia, yes, Mitchell did end up losing and getting finished. There was claims that he was ill leading up to the fight. Again, how much stock you can put in that, I'm not sure. But Mitchell did an okay job against Taporia. Probably a better job than most of Taporia's opponents have had against him. And Mitchell did shoot takedowns. He did get on top of Taporia at times. It's just Taporia was too much for him. So against Dan Ige, I do think there's going to be back and forth battles. I do think Mitchell's going to shoot takedowns on Ige. I do think Ige will be able to get back up from time to time. But eventually... Bryce Mitchell, if he's relentless in this fight, which we have seen him relentless with his wrestling before, he will just keep pouring on that wrestling. And the fact that this is three rounds, I think, helps Mitchell because it just allows him to be able to pile extra pressure early in this fight as well, knowing that three rounds is all that he needs. And if he takes two out of those three rounds, which I think is absolutely possible, then again, that's going to allow him to win the fight. Bryce Mitchell just needs to be careful of the hands of Dan Ige. If Ige does manage to keep the distance and the range the way he did against Damon Jackson, with Mitchell shooting in takedowns, becoming a little desperate, and the takedowns are a little bit too far off, and they're getting telegraphed, then Dan, we're going to see a repeat of that Ige versus Damon Jackson fight, where Ige pieces Mitchell up and potentially knocks him out. So those are the things from Mitchell. It's just, I think Mitchell's a much better striker than what... Damon Jackson is, and again, I know we're comparing fighters to fighters, but both fighters have fought very similar styles to each other. I think Mitchell's a better version of Damon Jackson. I think Tapori is a better version of Dan Ige. And I just feel both of those are relevant fights for when you're studying and analysing this fight. I do think the striking is going to be close between both fighters. But I do anticipate wrestling and grappling having a factor on how this fight is determined, whether there's a finish or whether it goes to the scorecards. So because of that, that's where I believe that Bryce Mitchell is best in this fight within the wrestling, the relentless wrestling and the top side grappling. He's very heavy, very good, crafty grappler as well. So for those reasons, I'm picking Bryce Mitchell to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a rematch between Marina Rodriguez and Michelle Waterson Gomez. So these two ladies met each other two years ago, back in 2021. I believe it was a short notice fight, though, that one of the fighters, I don't remember which one, was scheduled to fight. The opponent dropped out, and then the other one stepped up, and just so there wasn't any harsh weight cuts or anything like that, I'm pretty sure that they just fought at flyweight, or at least that's how I remember it anyway. But regardless, both fighters are now back at their actual weight class and this fight will take place at straw weight and to be honest I don't think the weight is that relevant because when you look at the flyweight fight yes Marina Rodriguez was the bigger flyweight but she's also going to be the bigger straw weight so maybe a bit more of a weight cut for Rodriguez but it's not as if you know she struggles in regards to the weight cut at least not that I'm aware of and also, there's only three rounds to work here where it was a five-round main event last time. So I don't think that the effect of the weight difference, the weight division is going to be an issue at all. I, I, feel, I actually feel like we're going to see pretty much the same fight here on Saturday night as what we saw in that main event, except for those additional two rounds. Marina Rodriguez beat Michelle Watson Gomez four rounds to one. One judge had it 3-2, but... I think it was very agreeable upon everybody in the MMA community that it was four rounds to one. So Marina Rodriguez took a very dominant win, outlanded Michelle Watson Gomez. She got taken down once, but again, I believe that was the round that she lost. And that's always been the Achilles heel of Marina Rodriguez. So she's got to try and avoid getting taken down in this fight. The thing is, Watson Gomez isn't like a relentless wrestler. She is predominantly a striker that developed the wrestling and grappling along the way. And I do think that it's got to be within the game plan of Waters and Gomez to take Rodriguez down. It's just I don't think that it's going to be relentless enough for it to have a factor on 
how this fight is won and lost. I think it's going to be won and lost on the feet. And again, I think Rodriguez is just a better quality striker moving both forwards and backwards. I think that she's better in more ranges, so she's better on the outside. I think from a boxing perspective, she's good. Then if you close the distance even further and you're looking inside the clinch, that's where Rodriguez is really dangerous. So I think Watson Gomez is again going to have a very tough fight here, a fight where she is going to get outlanded, she is going to get hit with hard shots, Rodriguez is also more varied in regards to the attack as well, so it's not just hands that she'll throw, she'll throw kicks, she'll throw knees, she'll throw elbows, and again, the key thing here is Rodriguez, in my opinion, is better at more ranges on the feet striking than what Waterson Gomez is. If Waterson Gomez does come into this fight, she is relentless with the wrestling, gives her more of a chance to win, but again, even if she's relentless with the wrestling, I think Rodriguez can defend some takedowns. I think if she is taken down, she might maybe get taken down in one round, lose that round. But the bigger work, the better moments in this fight, I do anticipate being on the feet. And that's, in my opinion, where Rodriguez is just much better than Waterson Gomez in regards to volume, speed, movement, power, range, reach, length. It just looks good for Rodriguez in this fight. So, yeah, for those reasons, I'm picking Marina Rodriguez to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Brian Battle versus AJ Fletcher. Interesting fight. I think for AJ Fletcher, he's got to try and wrestle and get Brian Battle down. And also for Fletcher, there is a blueprint on how to beat Brian Battle. We saw that when Renata Fakradinov beat him, he was constantly taking him down, holding him down. The thing is, AJ Fletcher is not Renata Fakradinov, and that's problem number one. Look, AJ Fletcher can wrestle, he can grapple, and he can strike as well, like he's he's a good striker, but the thing is, I'm just not sure he's a better striker than, striker than Brian Battle, I think Battle's also more dangerous in regards to power, he can shut your lights off in this division in just one shot, so Fletcher's got to be really careful about how aggressive he is coming into Brian Battle, because again, Brian Battle can counter strike with that power also, I kind of feel like it's not a really good fight for Fletcher. Battle's got decent takedown defense. He can get back up to his feet as well. And like I say, you can't judge that defensive wrestling and grappling from what you saw in the Fakradinov fight because Fakradinov's a Russian monster that's going to do that to a lot of opponents and that will make his way up the division. So it's one of those fights where, yeah, Battle did technically get exposed, but he got exposed by a fighter that's got much better qualities than the fighter that Battle's got in front of him for this fight on Saturday night with AJ Fletcher. And again, I don't mean any disrespect there. It's just... Like I've already said, Fakradinov's a monster. So for me, for Fletcher, if he tries to strike with Brian Battle, yes, Fletcher can be very fast. He's got good movement. He can take good angles, but he's also hittable. That's a big concern, especially if he is overly aggressive, which Fletcher likes to be in his fights. If he's not overly aggressive and he lets Brian Battle really control the range and the pace of the fight, then Battle's going to find his shots on Fletcher that, you know, when Fletcher's not moving his head off the center line and Battle will just get up on volume. The more volume he lands, the more dangerous he's going to be in regards to the likelihood of scoring a knockout. If Fletcher tries to wrestle Battle, yeah, he might get him down once or twice. You can never say never with that, but Fletcher does tire out when he overly wrestles. And I don't think Battle's just going to be a one takedown shot. He's down on the ground and then can't get back up again. I don't think it's going to be like that against Fletcher. Battle will make... Fletcher work if Fletcher wants to take him down and if he does take him down I wouldn't put it past battle to be able to get back up to his feet it's not as if Fletcher's got that super heavy top control pressure that the likes of again Fakradinov had so yeah I think it's a good fight for Brian Battle I think for the most part he defends the takedowns well gets back up if he does get taken down and then on the feet I think that Battle carries the power he's more dangerous and then like I said Fletcher's a little bit hittable as well so for all those reasons I'm picking Brian Battle to win this fight and in the next fight this is a super fun fight it should be in and around that co-main event in my opinion we've got Charles Jordan versus Hikado Hamos and like I said it's going to be a super fun fight I think it's going to be high pace high volume high intensity I think both fighters are going to love coming forwards I think they'll crash into the pocket as well and both fighters are going to have good moments in this fight and opportunities to win the fight. Like, for example, with Ricardo Hamos, I think he's going to have opportunities to take Jordan down and potentially take his back. Now, Jordan can be taken down. It's, in my opinion, probably one of his holes. We've seen him taken down quite a bit in the UFC. But the one thing that saves Jordan 
more often than not is the fact that he is a good grappler. He is a BJJ black belt himself and you can see that he works back up to his feet when he does get taken down. Like, yes, you can take him down, but yes, he'll normally pop right back up to his feet. The thing is, in some of his fights, Jordan likes to scoot towards the side of the cage, put his back up against the cage and then start to stand up by showing his back to his opponents. And that's where Hikado Hamos actually does a really good job of trying to get a hook in against the cage, pull his opponent down and take the back. Now, the one thing that you can say in regards to the counter of Charles Jordan is Charles Jordan defends re naked chokes really well. Look at the Shane Burgos fight. Burgos probably had minutes and minutes and minutes, so many opportunities to choke Jordan. And he got to the point where Burgos couldn't get under the chin, so he just tried to neck crank Jordan and he still didn't tap. Jordan's got that toughness, that grit, that heart. You know, he'll he'll fight until you put until you put him out, basically. Now, that's something, again, it's not great for Jordan because if Ricardo Hamas can't choke him, he'll just keep hold of that back position. And again, that's assuming that Hamo shoots on Jordan and then those situations flow and happen therefore after. The thing is with Ricardo Hamos. He does a good job of pre predominantly getting the trip takedowns, but he doesn't, he's not exactly like a takedown artist. He won't come out here and just completely turn relentless with wrestling and looking for trips and trying to take his opponent down at all times. He likes to strike as well. He's a good striker. That's, in my opinion, where he's going to get caught out by Charles Jordan because I think Jordan is a much better striker, a more educated striker. I think he probably packs a little bit more power too. And Jordan's really elusive with his speed, with his move, with his movement, switching stances. He's more varied. He'll throw kicks up and down the body. He'll put combinations together well, and he'll pile serious volume on his opponents. And he's also one of those fighters that if he does sl start slow, he'll eventually just methodically break his opponent down and then come on really hard towards the end of the fight. Again, we saw that in the Burgos fight as well. And then flipping back to Hamos, this is where Hamos is going to have issues because... Hamos does start pretty quickly. His first round's always his best round, at least in my opinion. And then by the time you get to the third round, he's slowed down significantly. The movement's not there anymore. He do, again, he doesn't gas out to the point where his hands are on his knees and he can't function. But he does slow down to where he's not bouncing around anymore. His movement is very slow. He's flat-footed. He turns into more of a one of those patient Muay Thai-style fighters. His volume falls off a cliff as well. And it's those moments where Charles Jordan will absolutely ramp this up 100% and will really put it on Ricardo Hamos. Now, again, flipping back to Hado, Ricardo Hamos' aside, one of the tools that he's got on his feet, and I don't know how he continuously and consistently lands this, but that spin back elbow is absolutely lethal. Now, the one thing I'll say from a negative aspect of Charles Jordan's side is Jordan can literally get head-to-head, -to -head, toe to toe with his opponents, where those types of spin attacks are likely to land. So Charles Jordan's really got to have done his stu his tape study on Ricardo Hamas and know that he's got to mind his P's and Q's in those moments or even just stay away from getting that close to Hamas because those spin-back elbows do land, they do hurt, they can knock your opponent out in just one shot. So with all that analysis that I've just given you from both sides very quickly from the striking perspective, the wrestling and grappling, you know, you've got to put it all together and how does the fight play out? Well, look, I think that if Hamos was more of a takedown heavy fighter so a fighter looking to take the fight down more often than not then Charles Jordan could be in trouble I do think Hamos will get Jordan down maybe once or twice I don't think that he keeps him down though I think Charles Jordan will get back up to his feet again with with Hamos's top side Hamos is a legit grappler he's a BJJ black belt very legit on the mat you can see that but the one thing that he does struggle with is holding his opponents down and keeping them down for long periods of time. Charles Jordan actually does a good job of not being kept down for long for long periods of time. So I think Charles Jordan's got the edge there and be able to get back up to his feet. Again, he's just got to mind his P's and Q's about showing his back to Hamos. But I think Hamos will get a takedown or two. I think Charles Jordan will make sure that he's up back up to his feet before it affects the fight in regards to how it's won and lost. And I do think the fight's won and lost on the feet because of that. And Charles Jordan, for me, in my opinion, he's got cardio for days. He can strike 
his, his volume is insane. He can put out 100 plus strikes, no problem. Whereas Ricardo Hamos's volume is low. It drops off the longer the fight goes on. Jordan builds the longer the fight goes on. And these are all things, in my opinion, that really just start to give Charles Jordan more upside than what we originally thought when we're looking at the analysis on both sides. Where Jordan does struggle in this fight, like I said, is if Ricardo Hamos gets on top, or sorry, gets his back against the cage, gets a body lock and keeps Charles Jordan there for a round, or the low percentage, or well, it's normally low percentage strike of the spin back elbow, obviously a higher percentage for Hamos that throws it with good education on the strike. But yeah, look, I think both fighters are going to have the moments, but when it comes to picking a winner and predicting who's going to win this fight, I like the fighter that's going to have more volume, have more pace, have more intensity, and the fighter that will build and get better in a fight against the fighter with low volume, not as much intensity, and will slow down the longer the fight goes on. So for those reasons, I'm picking Charles Jordan to win this fight. Next up, we've got Miles Johns versus Dan Argetta. Really still pissed off with... Dan Argetta's last fight against Ronnie Lawrence. I had Dan Argetta bet as an underdog against Lawrence. And obviously there was the controversial situation with Keith Peterson. It's actually similar to what happened last weekend with Chris Tognoni in the Daniel Lacerda and Edgar Chires fight where the referee thinks the fight is out. So they stop the fight and... Sorry, the referee thinks the fighter's out with a submission attempt, shall I say. Then they stop the fight and it turns out the fighter wasn't out at all. And then they can't restart and it goes down as a no contest. I bet Dan Argetta, Dan Argetta in my opinion, was probably not too far away from submitting Lawrence. But the referee stopped it early, it was a no contest. Now, coming into this fight with Miles Johns. Miles Johns does have some power in his hands. You can't take that away from him. He's got a wrestling background and... He can score takedowns, but then it's can he hold his opponent down? And this is where I think it's a really bad stylistic fight for Johns because Dan Argetta can also strike. The one thing that I will say with Argetta, and I said this last time, even though I bet him, is that Argetta can be a bit hittable. His head doesn't move too much. So Miles Johns will have some windows of opportunity in this fight to crack Argetta, hurt him, maybe drop him, finish the fight, or knock him out. I don't think it's a high probability of it happening but it's something that look John's packs power in his punches Dan Argetta can be hittable a bit too much keeping his head on the center line so there's there's, gonna, there's naturally going to be opportunities for John's but outside of that Argetta's got the pace he's got the volume he's got the forward pressure aggressive wrestling style I think that he will be able to take Johns down. Even if it's not a clean double leg or single leg, it'll be one of those where he shoots, Johns defends against the cage, and then Argetta just methodically makes his way into a position on the mat, whether it's taking him taking his back or, you know, getting a hook in and pulling the leg out and then pulling the fight against the cage. And, you know, Johns then has to get onto his back so he doesn't show his back that type of fight. And I think that the grappling is going to play a big factor in this fight for those reasons because Argetta will be looking to wrestle in this fight and I just feel that Argetta is going to be a nightmare for Miles Johns on the mat. You saw what he did against Ronnie Lawrence who is a good wrestler and grappler himself and he, those scrambles Argetta does a really, really good job. The only fighter that I've ever seen really push Argetta in the UFC at this level is Damon Jackson. But look at Damon Jackson's grappling. Again, it's a nightmare style. And our get is very similar to that. I think Johns is going to struggle in this fight. Whilst it's on the feet early, I think Johns might have opportunities to knock our getter out. But again, small window of opportunity, low probability of it happening. I think our getter gets the takedowns and just causes, you know, Miles Johns to have a nightmare performance in regards to the grappling. And again, that's not a negative of Johns' grappling. That's just because our getter is just that good, scrambly great position submission guy when it comes to top positioning on the mat and I think Johns is going to struggle there so for those reasons I'm picking Dan Argetta to win this fight and in the next fight this could be a really fun fight actually between two fighters that I'll be honest I don't really know what to expect from either fighter right now we've got Tim Means versus Andre Fialo and like I said it's tough to really know what to expect like Tim Means can look great in some fights but then he'll lose a fight against Kevin Holland, for example, like he looked good in that first round, but then fell off a cliff. And then you look at the Tim Means fight against Nicholas Dalby. I bet Tim Means in that fight, I thought that Tim Means had real good stylistic advantages. 
and he did win but he made it very very close and much closer than what I thought it was going to be you've got Andre Fialo on the other side which will look great one fight and then you know look nothing like his previous fight the following fight and then he'll look great again after that so you've got two fighters that at this moment in time in the careers are producing relatively inconsistent performances which is always going to be difficult to analyze now from my perspective Andre Fialo He's going to come out here hard. He'll try and put Tim Means out. Tim Means is aging. You know, he's closer towards the end of his career than he is his prime. And I think Fialo might see that as an opportunity to come out hot, throw big bombs, throw in volume, and try and get Means out of there early. The problem with that is if he doesn't get Means out of there early, Means is a veteran in this game. He's had so many fights. He's been around for years fighting you know, top-level competition and beating top-level competition as well, you know, earlier in his career. So if Means does weather that storm, then I really worry for Andre Fialo going forward because Fialo can tire out if he doesn't get that early knockout. Um, And yeah, it's just, it's one of those fights, in my opinion, where I kind of am putting it down to an Andre Fialo early win by finish, knockout, or Tim Means dragging the fight down the stretch, into deep waters, and getting either a late stoppage or a decision win himself. I do think that Fialo is going to win that first round regardless. I think he's going to come out hard, hot, heavy. And even if he doesn't finish means, I do think if it goes to the scorecards, we'll see Andre Fialo will have won that round one, maybe means then taking you know rounds two and three and winning 29-28. And then the flip side to this, if Fiello does come out patient, and I'm wrong, he doesn't come out hot and heavy, then I think that Means is better technically. So I think Means might end up just landing more volume. Maybe Fiello's landing the better, or sorry, more powerful strikes, but just not enough of them because he's being patient. So yeah, I feel like Fiello, if he comes out hot and heavy, like a bull at 100 miles an hour, he's got every chance of knocking Means out. But if he doesn't, then Means should be able to take over later in the fight if Fialo's tired out, tired out, which I'd imagine he would be. If Fialo comes out more patient, using technique, then I think Means is the more technical striker and will get the better of him in those exchanges. So it kind of does lean me towards Means, especially because I do think Fialo's going to come out fast and hard. And because of that, I always tend to side with the fighter to weather a storm, unless you're fighting like fucking Nganu. I do anticipate more often than not a fighter to weather a storm at this level in the UFC and then take over the fight late and that's what I'm siding with here so for those reasons I'm picking Tim Means to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Jacob Malkoon versus Cody Brundage now you do have to think it's now or never for Cody Brundage obviously he started his UFC career not too bad at all but now he's on a three fight losing streak and to be fair to Brundage, he's had good moments in some of those, in a couple of those fights where he started well, hurt his opponents, and he just cannot continue that performance once he starts well and he drops off a cliff. And then in his last fight against Cedrique Dumas, man, that was so hard to watch. It looked like he didn't even want to be in there. He was sloppy, he looked unmotivated, he wasn't really fighting back, his corner was going absolutely insane at him, telling him to, you know, wake up and start and telling him not to do certain things and then he'd go into the cage in the next round and do the things he's just been told not to do and yeah, it was a real, real difficult performance to watch. Now, Jacob Malkoon, Malkoon's a fighter that I definitely thought when he first signed with the UFC and I watched tape on him before his UFC debut that this fighter was going to have some issues in the UFC, but he's proved me wrong. Malkoon is actually one of these really consistent guys, like a Mr. Reliable type of guy. You know what he's going to give you. He's going to give you, you know, average strike. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean average from a UFC caliber perspective. Of course, he's going to be a better striker than me, but, you know, he's going to give you average striking. He's going to make his way into a clinch. He's going to try and take you down. And when he takes you down, he's just like this sea lion on top of you that you just can't shake off. That's what you're going to get with Malkoon. He's very meat and potatoes. You know what you're going to get. He'll deliver. And I actually think it's going to be a tough fight for Brundage. And I also think it's going to be a very similar fight to you know one ones that I've described previously where maybe Brundage will catch Malkoon early. 
we will see maybe Malcoon take a couple of shots and, you know, get maybe a little bit hesitant initially and just, again, trying to mind his P's and Q's. But eventually, I think Malcoon's just going to get to Brundage, just like he does with most of the fighters that he fights. He'll just make his way into the fight, slow, steadily. And then suddenly, it's one of those fights where Malcoon hasn't started great, but then suddenly you're, you're halfway through the third round and you're thinking, well, damn, Malcoon's controlled pretty much all of this fight. Like, how did that happen? And I think it's going to be the same thing. We've seen Brundage get stuck on his back. I think Malcoon's going to make him stuck on his back. I think when you're looking at the wrestling, because Brundage does have a wrestling background, I don't think that it's going to be Brundage that's the one that engages more in this fight in regards to offensive wrestling. I think that's more likely to be on Malcoon. Therefore, Malcoon's more likely to be the one moving forwards and shooting the takedowns. And with Brundage on his back, that's where I think that he's just going to lose minutes of rounds and then the rounds and then the fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Jacob Malcoon to win this fight. And in the next fight, we're in the heavyweight division. We've got Jake Collier versus Mohamed Usman. Now, I really like Mohamed Usman. I have since I've watched him in The Ultimate Fighter. You know, he's took so much shit, Usman, from fans. You know, initially he wasn't going to beat Mitchell Sipe and then he wasn't going to win the Ultimate Fighter and then he was going to get beat by Zach Pauger. Then he was going to get knocked out by Junior Taffer. And man, I've been on Usman from all those fights. Like, I really like Usman. I don't think he's going to put out these exciting, exceptional performances, but the dude just knows how to win. Like, he'll fight through adversity. It doesn't matter if he's down a round or two. He'll keep going. He'll keep attacking. He'll target the legs with his striking. He'll target the body. He's got that wrestling background as well, although I don't think he uses it as much as he should. I think in this fight, it'll be a real tool for him. And he's not the biggest heavyweight in regards to, you know, carrying too much unneeded weight, shall we say. Like, he's got good cardio and he will push a pace for three rounds if he needs to. Now, with Jake Collier, Jake Collier is actually... A really good heavyweight himself, you know, he's not a fighter that's going to break the top 10 or become a future champion, but man, Collier does a good job inside the cage, he's efficient, he will have the occasional bad performances where he should win and he looks shocking, but for the most part, he's got decent output, and even though he does look like he's carrying unneeded weight, he's got good cardio, he can move for a heavyweight as well, remember he used to fight down at middleweight, so it's a good fight, I just feel that Collier is going to have some issues the longer this fight goes on so I think earlier early on in this fight Collier will land in the more strikes he doesn't pack knockout power into his punches he'd rather just accumulate volume and I think early in the fight he'll do a good job the thing is with Usman he's dangerous with that one punch power he can knock you out left and right and and I think Collier is gonna be very mindful of that and I think the earlier that Usman hits Collier hard with a big hard punch and gets the respect the better it's going to be for Usman just to you know keep Collier on his toes but then the longer this fight goes on I just think that Usman grinds on Collier I think that when we're looking at the fight inside the apex the cage is a smaller cage so Usman's not going to have to close the distance and work as hard as what he would in a bigger cage I think he'll be able to get Collier against the cage where Usman should be the more physical more dominant fighter in those clinch positions if the fight goes down to the mat and Usman gets on top of Collier I don't anticipate Collier getting back up to his feet if he does get settled on his back both shoulders on the mat type of thing so I think Collier's going to have moments I think the moment's going to come earlier rather than later I don't think that Collier's going to be able to finish Usman early so therefore I think Usman will grow the longer the fight goes on once he's made in cage adjustments which again is another real good trait of Usman as well so I like Usman for this fight I think he does a good job on the feet he's got the finishing upside I think if it goes to a decision then it's very likely that he's grinded his way to that decision and looks good throughout so for those reasons I'm picking Mohamed Usman to win this fight and in the next fight, we've got Mizuki Inoue versus Hannah Goldie. Now, Inoue is a fighter that is, she's actually a really exciting fighter. We haven't seen her for three years. I'm not 100% sure why she's had that sort of layoff, but three years is probably the cutoff for a fighter that's going to have real ring rust issues once they get back into the cage. So it's one of those where she might take a, need a round just to feel her way into the fight. She might not. But man, like I said, Mizuki Inoue is was one of the fighters that I was really excited to see the development of a number of years ago and of course we haven't seen her for a few years her last fight was against Amanda Lemos Lemos I believe was an underdog in that fight as well so that was back when nobody 
really knew too much about Lemos and obviously we, we've seen what Lemos has done since then, you know, fighting away up the division and suddenly that loss really doesn't look that bad for Inoue, especially because Inoue had some good moments in that fight itself. I kind of feel though that the UFC have given or thrown Inoue a bone here with Hannah Goldie. Look, we know that you're exciting. We know you haven't fought in three years. Let's give you an opponent that isn't going to be as tough as your last opponent, an opponent you should be beating let's get that ring rust out of the way and let's get you back on a win streak and let's get you back active. It seems like that type of fight. And I don't mean any disrespect to Hannah Goldie when I say that. It's just Mizuki in a way from a skill set perspective. I think she's the better striker. I think she's going to land more volume. I think she's going to be faster and the better mover on the feet. In regards to the wrestling, maybe that's where in a way struggles. If, if she does try and get a bit too physical with Hannah Goldie, who is very, very physical, that's where Goldie's going to have her advantage here against in a way. I do think Goldie's going to be stronger and just be harder to deal with when, or if these two women tie up with each other. But then when you look at the grappling, in a way is the better grappler as well. So really for the advantages for Hannah Goldie, look, she can strike, she can wrestle and grapple herself, but of course she can. Like it's very rare that, a UFC fighter isn't well-rounded to an extent. But Mizuki, in a way, is going to be better in more disciplines within mixed martial arts. I think that with Goldie, her biggest advantage in this fight is going to be a physicality rather than her skill set. And that's always going to be an issue. So for those reasons, I'm picking Mizuki, in a way, to win this fight. And the final fight to break down, we've got a newcomer, Montserrat Rendon versus Tamirez Vidal. And... Yeah, Montserrat Rendon, for those that haven't watched her, don't know who she is, making UFC debut, 5-0. I'm not really that impressed, if I'm being totally honest. Like, she does do some good work. She's predominantly a boxing-heavy striker, at least from what I've seen. She will look to close the distance and tie up inside the clinch in bursts. But, like I say, for the most part, not too many kicks from her, more boxing more hands that she uses but she doesn't put together long combinations either so it's only ever one punch or two punches at a time she doesn't seem to be overly aggressive and put too much pressure on on the back foot when her opponent's pushing her back she can flap a little bit you know look a little bit unsure become defensively vulnerable and available to hit and I think all this sort of analysis that I've just outlaid for Rendon is going to play right into the path of Tamirez Vidal. Tamirez Vidal, I don't think she's the quickest, heaviest, more elusive mover that we've seen in the division but I do think that she's aggressive and she is physical and she's powerful and I think that if she puts the pace on Rendon here and tries to be aggressive using that forward pressure I think Rendon is going to panic with Vidal coming at her who does have power who can crack hard who is a very varied striker you know she'll use elbows knees and kicks as well as her hands whereas Rendon seems to be more seems to be more one-dimensional when it comes to the striking and like I say, even if Rendon does come forward herself and has those bursts of forward pressure to close the distance in the clinch, I think Vidal's going to be more dominant in the clinch. I think she's going to be more physical in the clinch and more dangerous in the clinch with the elbows and knees as well. So I kind of feel like it's a pretty bad fight for Rendon. I think for Rendon to win this fight, she's going to have to circle and skate around the side of the cage looking to pot shot Vidal as she's coming into range and hopefully just try and rack up that volume but again Rendon does look to be relatively low volume just because she isn't put, putting together long combinations and ripping to the head and body like again it's very one-dimensional it's not as if it's a boxing style that will mix between head and body it's a boxing style that really does head hunt so I think it's a good fight for Vidal stylistically physically and then from an experience perspective this is by far the best opponent that Rendon will have fought in a career so for those reasons I'm picking Tamirez Vidal to win this fight and that's all for this episode of the podcast once again for everybody thank you for tuning in thank you for listening whether you're on one of the podcast podcast platforms like Spotify Amazon Music Apple Music or whether you've tuned in onto YouTube if you've tuned in on YouTube you haven't subscribed please subscribe it does help the channel and like I say we've got a week break next week and then the week after that I'm coming just coming back off holiday so there'll be no podcast there and that's all for this long last haul of UFC, consecutive UFC events. I'm going to take it to enjoy myself and I'll see you all when I get back.